This is Scott Stanley with DTG Ministries, exploring the deep things of God in the book of Revelation. In our podcast, we have come to Revelation chapter 11, verse 13. And I want to give you the most in-depth understanding of what we're reading here that I can because there is so much background in verse 13 the same hour there came to be or there was a great earthquake the tenth part of the city fell and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand and the remnant came to be or were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven so there is a prophecy in Malachi chapter 4 starting at verse 1 for behold the day is coming that shall burn as an oven and all the proud yea and all that do wickedly shall be stubble and the day that comes shall burn them up saith Jehovah of hosts that it shall leave them neither root nor branch I see that as the very end of the world when this world explodes when men destroy the world not God verse 2 but unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings and you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall you shall tread down the wicked iniquity thoughts within yourself. He's not talking about the people that he mentions in verse 1, the wicked in verse 1. He's talking about the as you grow up, as calves in the stall, you're going to tread down the iniquity. So it's got to be put where? Under your feet. This is the point. This is what he says. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day I do this, saith the Lord. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Well, I want you to turn to Matthew 11 because... I want to talk a little bit about the spirit of Elijah and Elijah coming. He says in Matthew chapter 11, I want to read verse 12, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and law prophesied until John. If you will receive it, this is the Elijah which was for to come. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Now notice that the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. There's going to be a message about the kingdom of heaven, which, notice again, the law and the prophets were until John. So you've got the law and the prophets. John comes in the spirit of Elijah and the kingdom of heaven suffers violence the truth about the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and for people who are going to believe and enter into the kingdom if the law and the prophets are going away then you definitely you're going to suffer violence making those changes like that I want to turn to chapter 17. We're in Matthew. Look at chapter 17, verse 10. His disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elijah must first come? See, quoting Malachi 4. Verse 11, Jesus answered and said, Elijah truly shall first come and he will restore all things. But I say unto you, Elijah is come already, and they knew him not, but they have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. 
Then the disciples understood he spoke unto them of John the Baptist. So using this, I realized that John the Baptist was a type of Elijah. But there is an Elijah message that is going to come at the end of the world before the day burns as an oven, before the world reaches that place as Sodom where there is not one righteous in it. And man will destroy the planet. So how does John the Baptist fit into this? And what exactly is the Elijah message? When I look at the end of the world, we're using Revelation and identifying, you know, Isaiah 59, 20, and 21, and how the Lord is going to roar out of Zion unto Jacob. And I go to Revelation 10, and I see the church being given the little book and being told to go prophesy again. And in chapter 11, they're told, don't go to the Gentile. Go to Jacob, go to, leaving Israel. Go to, go to Jacob and give them the message. Well, in Revelation, he describes that message being given as to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And we see the struggle that Jacob will have with that. They, they don't want to believe what you're saying, but they can't bury that truth. They can't just put it away because they know their own Bible says to do that. Well, where is Elijah in that? Well, Elijah is seen in the message of the two witnesses. And I want to tell you right now, if you go back and look again at the podcast on the two witnesses, where I went in explaining how Christ, and again, using the Old Testament, how Christ gave the first covenant. He is the same one who gives the second covenant. He has to lay down his life to make that happen. And then you go to Psalm 40. All of that before is Jeremiah 31, looking at the covenants. I'm going to make a new covenant with you, not like the one I made with your fathers when I brought them out of Egypt. So it's the same guy making the first and second covenant. First covenant's the Ten Commandments, Deuteronomy 4.13. So we see the Son of God says, A body you have given me. Sacrifice, an offering for sacrifice, You, this isn't what you've wanted. You've given me a body. So... Here, the God of Israel is going to become a human being, according to their scriptures, and replace animal sacrifices. How does John the Baptist play into this? Because remember his testimony when he pointed to Jesus and he said, Behold, the Lamb which takes away the sin of the world. He just said that this guy I'm pointing to is the lamb. He is the lamb. In essence, he is replacing your sacrificial lamb. He is the lamb. That's Psalm 40. Sacrifice and offering you would not. A body you have given me. Christ fulfilled that, and John the Baptist in that sense was the spirit of Elijah. Because if I look at teaching the Jew or teaching Jacob about how their Savior is the God of Israel who has to give his life to fulfill the second covenant, who becomes a man and replaces animal sacrifice, that is the Elijah message. That is what will happen at the end and that is what the two witnesses are carrying in their message. They're talking to Jacob. They're not using the New Testament. They're using the Old Testament 
to give the message of the love of God and the cross. And what I shared, again, in that podcast about the two witnesses, I believe with all my heart, that is the message. So if I take this now, and I go back to 1 Kings chapter 17. This is where Elijah comes into the picture. And I'm not going to go over this whole chapter. This really needs to be understood. But you'll see Elijah in verse 8. Jehovah came to him and said, Get thee to Zarephath, which belongs to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain you. And this whole Zidon thing is interesting because if you look at, you're in 1 Kings, look at chapter 16, verse 31. It came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. He took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, king of the Zidonians, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. So the Zidonians were Baal worshippers. And here you've got Jezebel coming into the picture. Why is that significant? Because Jezebel is used in Revelation chapter 2 concerning Thyatira. And it says, verse 20, in Revelation 2.20, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against you, because you're suffering or allowing that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and eat things sacrificed to idols. Why is this significant? Because the verse, two verses above it, unto the messenger of the church of Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God. That right there, the Son of God, is the only time that is used in the book of Revelation, Son of God. It's at this point if we're realizing the seven churches and that it is a process or seven steps that we go through to come to Revelation 4.1 where you hear the voice saying, come up here. This church, Thyatira, is given the Godhead message. Until then... She's allowing Jezebel to teach. Jezebel represents Baal. The Trinity doctrine is symbolized in Baal worship. You know, Baal means Lord. And I always thought, well, that's interesting. Uh, You've got this other god, Baal, and they're calling him Lord. Well, that's the Trinity. It's no different. It's another God. There is no God like the Trinity. There is no such thing. And so I look at Elijah in 1 Kings 17. He's being sent to a Gentile. And Christ refers to this in Luke 4. Called Sarepta. Where he's talking about the Gentile woman. Well remember a woman is the emotional side. And this woman, see, Elijah, here is a picture of the Elijah message. Look at what he does. He comes to the Gentile first. And the Lord says, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Her husband has died. Now let's just follow these symbols. He arose and went to Zarepta, or Zarephath, When he came to the gate of the city, the widow woman was there gathering sticks, and he called her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread. 
And she said, As Jehovah thy God lives, I have not a cake or a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. So her sticks, see, in the Old Testament, the word tree is the same word council. And for her to just have a few sticks, that means she has little understanding. She has little counsel. And she has just a little oil, a handful of meal. Meal is how you make bread, or it represents the scriptures. She just has a small portion, just a small understanding. Why? Because he is portraying, the Lord is using this to portray what is going on in this Elijah message and how the Elijah message comes against Baal worship or the Trinity. So here is a woman who has just a small understanding. And watch what he, what happens here. And Elijah said unto her, verse 13, Fear not, go and do as you have said, but make me a little cake first. Bring it to me, and after that, for you and your son. So he's testing her willingness See, to follow the Lord, to walk in love. For thus saith Jehovah, God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that Jehovah sends rain on the earth. So here is a promise that you're not going to lose what you have. It's going to increase. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, And she and he in her house did eat many days, and the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of Jehovah, which he spoke by Elijah. It came to pass after these things, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. His sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. Her son, this woman, the son she is carrying, is the trinity understanding of Jesus. How do I know? Watch what happens. Verse 18. She said to Elijah, What have I to do with you, O thou man of God? Have you come to me to call my sin to remembrance and slay my son? Say, when the message is given and you're sharing with people about iniquity, Christ came to redeem you from all iniquity. He didn't come to pay your sin debt. Well, the God of the Trinity cannot help you there. There's no he, he, When you explain what iniquity is, their God cannot help them. You're putting their God to death. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. The understanding you have of Jesus Christ can help you overcome iniquity. Not Trinitarians. They don't have that. They don't have that advantage. All they're told is, he's going to pay my debt. When you start applying it to sin in your life, all you do is, God forgive me, God forgive me, God forgive me, hey, God forgive me. It just goes on and on. You can't stop. You have the Romans 7 experience. So, verse 19, he said unto her, Give me your son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up to the loft where he abode, and laid him upon his own bed, where he finds rest. It's bringing him to his understanding of Jesus. See, all this is a similitude. And he cried unto Jehovah and said, O Jehovah my God, have you also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times. Well, that word stretched is measure. He measured her Jesus three times and brought the the child back to life. If I'm going to take the Trinity understanding of Jesus and measure it three times, I'm going to measure that understanding according to the truth of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's what they're believing. They're saying there's one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons. Well, let's take their understanding of Jesus and measure it according 
to the true Father, the true Son, the true meaning of the Holy Spirit. And in so doing, you can bring their Jesus back to life. Their understanding of God will be redeemed. And when he redeems her son, when he brings him back, verse 24, the woman said to Elijah, By this I know you're a man of God, that the word of Jehovah is in, is in your mouth is truth. So that is an allegory you could say. It actually happened. But it pictures, it's a likeness of a spiritual truth of what's going to happen at the end of the world. So Elijah goes first to the Gentile. Well, second, if you'll look at chapter 19. Now I'm skipping some stories because I've just got to make this point so I can get back to Revelation 11. 1 Kings 19, verse 8, Elijah comes to Mount Horeb. Now, Horeb is the Ten Commandments. This is where the Ten Commandments see the first covenant. Now he's talking to Jacob. This is a, an allegory of how the church will address Jacob. Verse 9, he came unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of Jehovah came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Again, this is 1 Kings 19, 10. And he said, I've been very jealous for Jehovah, God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've thrown down your altars. They've slain your prophets with the sword. And I, I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before Jehovah. And behold, Jehovah passed by, and a great strong wind rent the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before Jehovah. But Jehovah was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But Jehovah was not in the earthquake. What does that mean? You understand it when you see that this wind rent the mountains and broken pieces of the rocks. Mountains are doctrines. Stones and rocks are concepts. Here, he is at Horeb where the Ten Commandments were given, and you see the wind destroying that doctrine the Ten Commandments were trying to bring and rending in pieces all the concepts of it. Next you see the earthquake. How people will use that law after destroying what it actually means. They will then use the law to try to bring conviction on you for not going to church on Saturday, for a list of things. Oh, you lusted. Oh, you this. See, they try to bring conviction using the law and judgment against you. And the next thing is fire. They use fire, fiery words, a fiery attitude. After destroying the law and trying to convict you to keep the law the way they think you should, next comes fire out of their mouth. After the fire, there was a still small voice. It was so when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in the mantle and went out. After the fire, there was a still small voice. Well, what did the Lord say to him? At the end of verse 11, see, Jehovah wasn't in the wind, he wasn't in the earthquake, and he isn't in the fire. He's in a still small voice. So you've got this explanation of the law distorted being used to try to convict you to keep the law according to the way they interpret it, using fiery words to do it. And Jehovah says, I'm not in any of that. That isn't me. I'm in a still small voice. Well, you've just transitioned from that first covenant which they destroyed 
to the second one where I will put this on your heart. Say, I'm going to put this on your heart. I'm going to give you a new covenant. We're going to redefine. We're going to fix this. And I will give you a new covenant. And I will be on your heart. I'm going to write this law on your heart. He will speak to you through a still small voice, not through people hammering you with what they believe you should be doing in keeping the law. Next, verse 13. It was so when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave and behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What are you doing here? See, it's the same thing that you see in verse 9. And he gives him the same answer that you see in verse 10. Verse 14, I have been very jealous for Jehovah, God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, slain your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And Jehovah said, Go and return on your way back to the wilderness of Damascus. When you come, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shall you anoint to be king over Israel. Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abimelahola, shall you anoint to be prophet in your stead. It'll come to pass that the guy that escapes the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapes the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. So here, the way I'm looking at this, when I look at the king of Syria, I'm looking at a corrupt government. When I look at Israel, I'm looking at a corrupt church. When I look at Elisha, I'm looking at someone who brings the Elijah message. Why? Because Elisha was with Elijah when he was taken to heaven. Elijah threw down his mantle to him, and Elisha had a double portion of Elijah's understanding. Elisha is a continuation of Elijah only carrying the information of the double which, in Isaiah 40, comfort ye my people, so your warfare is accomplished because you have received the double, the message of Elisha. Now notice, this is where in verse 18, after he says, shall Elisha slay, then he says this, yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed to Baal and every mouth which has not kissed him. That is Revelation 11. Let me show you. Turn back to Revelation 11. We're looking at verse 13. The same hour there was a great earthquake, great conviction, and the tenth part of the city fell and in that conviction were slain 7,000 names of men. That is what the Elisha, Elijah message will do. When you take the Elijah message and add to it the double, the ultimate double is Jesus Christ on that cross and you. But if I take the Elijah message that the God of Israel will become a man and replace animal sacrifice, 7,000 names of men die. In other words, they give their heart to the Lord. Elisha doesn't slay anybody literally, but his message will help put to death that old man. His message will help put to death your spiritual self so that you can be given a new spirit and come alive unto God. 
And it's interesting, see, when you look at Revelation eleven thirteen, this is like a summing up of what happens. Revelation 12 is a continuation, a magnifying glass on what you're seeing in Revelation 11. So that is why when you see in Revelation 11, 13, a tenth part of the city fell. I'm going to explain that in the next podcast, what exactly that means. Well, in this conviction, men will give their heart to God. When they hear the understanding of the devil. The Elijah message in understanding how the God of Israel gave both covenants, the God of Israel became a man, replaced animal sacrifice by giving his life to redeem us from all iniquity. That message goes to the Gentile and to the Jew. But When you're talking to the Gentile church, or let's say the Baptist, he'll deny father and son. The Jew will deny Christ as Messiah. Two different things going on, but the Elijah message will correct both. And when you take your understanding of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and measure their Jesus to that, if they let you do it, you can redeem their understanding of Christ, resurrect their Son, the Son they have brought forth, in their understanding, and heal them from all of the devastation the Trinity does to a human being, to a church, to a nation. I, you know, I look at this country and I blame it all on the churches. They do not teach truth. They do not teach true morality. They don't understand it. They don't know how to overcome sin. And they replace every truth with excuses why they are right. Hence, you've got their locust. You've got their fire coming up from Guyana, from the rage that happens in them when you teach them the truth about the Son of God. Most gracious Heavenly Father, please help us learn and grow and see and glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen.